Today is the 11th of August, 2009. We are in Margaretville, New York at the American Legion Post number 216. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm from the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name I'm, and your date and place of birth, please? I'm Paul B. for Bernard Steinfeld, S-T-E-I-N-F-E-L-D. I was born in the Bronx, December 28, 1918. Okay, and did you attend school in the Bronx? I attended uh, school in the Bronx, including high school at Evander Childs High School in the Bronx. I graduated from high school in 1936, and then I entered City College of New York and graduated with a BA degree in 1940. Okay, and uh, do you remember where you were when you heard about the attack at Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was employed in civil service in Washington, uh, D.C. Um, in the uh, tabulating of the 1940 census. I worked for the U.S. Census Bureau. Oh. And uh, I remember uh, getting the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And we lived in Washington on one of the main streets, uh, uh, downtown on East 3rd Street. And here we were still on Peabody Street. Oh, we lived at that I time at people. I think so. I no, think because I heard the... Because so, so you were married at that time? We were married in uh, June about, of... About five, years, five months. We were married in uh, June of 1941. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember hearing army trucks coming down uh, the street, the mm -hmm. third That's street. Right. Uh, moving soldiers from one place to another. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a very vivid recollection uh, of that uh, morning that they announced uh, mm -hmm. the invasion of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Did you notice uh, a change in, in your life right after that? <laughs> Well, we were very aware um, of the war, and uh, uh, they had uh, what they called the, the lottery. Uh, everyone had to enroll, and mm -hmm. then they picked out of the, what they called the goldfish bowl your uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Your draft number or her name? The draft number, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I picked uh, near the bottom of the list so that I wasn't expected to be drafted for some time. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of that lottery, we got married, mm -hmm. um, thinking it'll be some time before I was called up. Well, if I may interrupt, December 5th, 1941, you were called for the, to the draft board for a hearing. And quite coincidentally, you were classified that same day, two days before Pearl Harbor, they classified him deferred. Uh -huh. So it happened that his draft status remained deferred for quite a while. Okay. okay. And when did you end up getting drafted? Um, I, I was uh, drafted uh, very early in 1944. I think it was February 1944. And at that time, it was the ground phase of the war in Europe. Okay. Let, me, ju let me just go back a little bit. So from 1941, to 1944, were you still involved with the census? Uh, no. Um, we finished the census business, and I became a clerk for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers 
I, I was shifted from the Census Bureau. So you were a civilian working? I was a civilian working for the U.S. Army. Um, uh, at that time, uh, the U.S. Army greatly expanded the number of civilian employees. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get a transfer um, uh, in the War Department from um, Washington, D.C. Uh, to New York. I should mention that my job for a while uh, with, as a civilian uh, worker was um, uh, helping in the uh, survey of the ground for the Pentagon building. I was a rodman and chainman oh. uh, for the surveyors who were surveying the area mm -hmm. for the construction of the Pentagon. So I was in on the, the building ground floor. of the Pentagon <laughs> from the very beginning. Uh -huh. And uh, I saw the first uh, crews coming in to break soil for the foundations of the Pentagon building. Mm -hmm. And it was after that that I was transferred to the New York office. And uh, we lived in Forest Hills, New York. Mm -hmm. When they called me up uh, for the draft, they were reaching okay. the... But until, my, you, until you were called up, what you did was you were an inspector of materials that would be being sent abroad for military use. Now, were you affected at all by by shortages or or rationing during that period of time? No, not in any way that bothered us because okay. we just didn't feel it was appropriate even to feel deprived when mm -hmm. men were serving in mm -hmm. the infantry. Okay, uh, so we, you were drafted in 1944. Well, February, I think, 1944, and uh, I was in um, New Jersey, Fort Dix. Dix, New Jersey, which was a reception center. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there for several weeks, and they kept calling different people with different skills. And uh, uh, finally, they, they called everyone out. And we were there it was for the infantry. Well, on one side of the street, they lined us up. We were infantry. The other side was artillery. I landed up on the infantry side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was um, sent to... Um, oh, what? Uh, uh, Indian Town Camp. Indian Town Camp, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Near for, Harrisburg. For your basic training. For my basic training. And my basic training was with um, the 95th Infantry Division. They they organized training platoons. Okay. Now you were a you were a college graduate. Yes. Were you uh, probably one of the the only college graduates in the company at that time? <coughs> I think so. Mm -hmm. Did they offer you? Uh, Officer Candidate School or anything like that? Uh, no. Okay. All right. So you completed basic training. Yes. And you were assigned to the 95th Division. Right. Okay. Yes. And, and then did you go overseas shortly well, after? The 95th Division was already a seasoned, trained group. Mm -hmm. They had been in de desert maneuvers. Um, and I think the last thing they did while you, while you were already there was mountain maneuvers in West Virginia. Yes, I so went on. They had oh. every terrain. I went on mountain maneuvers with them. And uh, then when we finished the mountain maneuvers, they shipped us to... Uh, Camp Miles Standish in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts for shipment overseas. Right. So you went overseas with the whole division? Yes. Uh, we broke up into uh, uh, regiments. Mm -hmm. and I remember we 
set sail uh, on the U.S. Um, was it Liberty? What was the name of the ship? I think. Was it the Aquitania? No. I think they call it the Liberty, but it had been a, a tourist vessel before that, mm -hmm. and I think it was known as the America. Okay. Now, did you did you go over in a convoy or single ship? We went over in a convoy, and we could see the um, the navy uh, vessels in a distance were patrolling the waters mm -hmm. with us. And I remember zigzagging every now and then. The ship would veer sharply and off mm -hmm. one one direction, come back in another. It was to avoid torpedoes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we we landed uh, in uh, Liverpool. southern England. In Liverpool, I think. Liver I think it was Liverpool. Yeah. Yeah, because you remember walking uh, and, uh, in Liverpool with your barracks bags of trail and yeah. the ship. And they, they sent us to one of the regular British Army bases uh, it wasn't Liverpool, it was um, where the big cathedral is, uh, mm -hmm. Westminster. Okay. Westminster Salisbury. Barracks. Salisbury, uh, Salisbury, Salisbury cathedral. cathedral. Well, but it was, uh, I think it was Westminster Barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were in a, a barracks there. Um, for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but they kept us uh, in shape by hiking. We hiked all over the British countryside. Uh -huh. I remember admiring the roadside flowers that grew along the British countryside. I thought they had planted them, but I learned later that they were natural growth there, mm. and they uh, 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 they had a very beautiful countryside. Mm -hmm. We walked through villages where the old roofs of the houses were um, thatched, thatched mm -hmm. with branches. Uh, I remember thinking England was very quaint and pretty. Uh, but then after a few weeks, uh, 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 we were shipped across the canal channel. The, cha uh, the, the channel, rather. Mm. Uh, the, the channel uh, uh, into um, France, um, Normandy. We arrived in Normandy about a month after D-Day. After the invasion, okay. A month after the invasion, and they quartered us in, in uh, tents in Normandy mm -hmm. uh, until uh, they put us on train, uh, they called them train 40 or 8 mm -hmm. from World War I. It was 40 men or 8 horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually were 40 men in a, um, um, a freight train. And uh, there really wasn't room for all 40 to lie down and sleep at once. We had to take shifts and mm -hmm. using the floor space for sleeping and we were as i recall was five or six days to cross oh, really? over because every now and then they'd stop and um, i don't know what they were doing maybe scouting out the railroad banks ahead mm -hmm. but they'd stop and wait for anywhere from a few minutes to a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did you have uh, toilet facilities on the on the uh, box cars no, at all? No, we, when I stopped, we used the outdoors. I there see. were no facilities in the, in the cars. Um, and um, I remember that the, that the train stopped near the old uh, battlefields of World War One, what was it that... Uh, Verdun? 
were never done. Mm -hmm. We got off the train, never done. Uh, and then uh, we went by uh, truck uh, uh, into um, Lorraine province in uh, France, that eastern France, and mm -hmm. Alsace and Lorraine, which pivoted back and forth between Germany and and France, depending on which war it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we were there, um, uh, it was officially French and, and, and Lorraine. The Germans called it Lothringen, I remember. Uh, I had uh, studied the German in uh, both high school and college, so I could speak uh, German. Mm -hmm. And it was um, very useful to me because it helped me capture prisoners uh, when I was in action on my knowledge of German. So, so they used you for an interpreter, too? Mm -hmm. uh, not officially, but mm -hmm. unofficially. In my, in my squad, I was the interpreter. Mm -hmm. What was it like the first time you uh, went into action? Well, uh, we were in foxholes outside of, um, uh, what was that town? Metz. Metz. Oh, that was before, before the Metz. town. It was near Metz. Uh, we were in foxholes, and my first action was a night patrol uh, into enemy lines with a mission to bring back prisoners, and we were successful. We, uh, my, there my German help, we, we saw a faint light, uh, and it developed that the light came from a fire in a cave, and there was a blanket over the cave, and there was just a, a rip in the blanket that enabled us to see <laughs> light there. And I called on them in German to come out and surrender or we'd kill them. And uh, sure enough, uh, five men came out with their hands up. Mm -hmm. And we took them back to uh, headquarters in that little town, that's uh, name I can't think of at the moment. Uh, that's where the, our, our company headquarters were, so we brought back prisoners for interrogation. Mm -hmm. That was my first combat mission. But um, that was really uh, mild. Uh, we were, um, uh, later on, uh, um, uh, advancing right up to the city, the gates of the city of Metz. Mm -hmm. And they had artillery in, in the town walls that they pounded us with. But uh, I remember my squad uh, uh, made its way uh, just at the outskirts of the city. There was a little farmhouse and we occupied that farmhouse. And uh, unfortunately, this was our uh, most serious loss. There was a, a, a foxhole up against a wall of the barn. Yeah, there was stone barn in that farmhouse. And Five of our men jumped into that hole. Mm -hmm. I remember trying to get in there, but it was full already. So I, I couldn't get into that hole, but uh, uh, dug myself a little hole in the garden uh, uh, several yards from that wall. And the, the Germans had zeroed in to that foxhole, uh, and they uh, they sent a shell against that wall, which 
the shrapnel fell down and killed all five men in that foxhole. Mm. And I had just missed uh, getting in there. Uh, all five were killed, but the, the shrapnel just rained down on mm. them into the hole. Uh, that was the most serious loss in our company, and, uh, uh, and that hole was our uh, squad sergeant. Uh, you know, there are 12 men um, in a squad, and uh, when he was killed there in that hole, they made me a sergeant to replace mm -hmm. him. And uh, I went through the rest of my war experience as a sergeant in G Company, 379th Infantry. Um, uh, let's see from there. Um, uh, we, uh, we went in boats across the Moselle River to mm -hmm. the city of Metz. And um, we liberated the Metz there from the Germans. Metz was, you know, in Lorraine and it sort of divided between uh, French and German inhabitants. Mm -hmm. The French uh, were all lo loyal to France and they, they felt that we had liberated them. And to this day there is in France in uh, in Metz, uh, an association of friends of the 95th Division, all liberators, they mm -hmm. call them. And that, that would, uh, you still hear from that organization. I say we, because I'm a member of the 95th Infantry Association of Veterans, mm -hmm. and we get mail from them. Uh, they, they still remember the day of their liberation, and they have a parade then. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the uh, last uh, reunion of my uh, 95th Division was just earlier this month out in uh, Oklahoma, but I wasn't able to get there. Um, but uh, uh, one of my uh, buddies, uh, um, gave me a souvenir booklet from that. I, I didn't bring it. Um, Maybe you want to mention the Maginot Line forts from, from World War I time, which were still fortified. Yes. Um, in our advance toward Mets, we encountered uh, uh, old forts, mm -hmm. thick concrete walls, and guns mounted on the walls. Um, uh, and uh, I was amazed that we got through there. I told you we lost five men from one of those guns. But uh, we got through there. And they came out and surrendered when we poured rifle fire into the holes in the walls. They, they mm -hmm. fired in holes. And I, uh, with my German, I asked one of them, how come you surrendered? He said, we're out of ammunition. Hmm. And I said, well, at least the Air Force did something for us because, you know, we felt the Air Force was alone distance away and didn't affect us particularly, but I saw at that moment that the Air Force had wrecked their supply lines mm -hmm. and uh, they had no ammunition. That's why they surrendered to my unit. You went into one of the forts and there was a horse walking along, oh, yeah. I remember. Uh, oh, we, we stayed overnight. and. In the, one of the forts, we uh, we slept in their barracks, 
And I think I sent home some souvenirs that I rounded up in, in the fort. I, I, I remember making a little package and uh, sending it back to you. They had some something in the chest the, set. Oh yeah, there was a chest set <laughs> in the fort that I collected and sent home. And I think one or two little flags or something, some souvenirs in the Germans. <clears throat> we had a very uh, intense correspondence, and I, don't, I should have brought samples. I don't know if you've had at the museum, and we should provide some, because we have hundreds of letters that we exchange with each oh. other, mm -hmm. which were called V-mail. Yes. And they were reduced photographically mm -hmm. to about this size mm -hmm. from the usual airmail form. Um, so I knew a lot of what was going on during that period. Mm -hmm. Now, you eventually got into Germany? Uh, yes. Uh, I was one of the first units to cross the Saar River mm -hmm. into Germany. And um, um, I was in street fighting in Saarlauten, which was ju just the other side of the river, mm -hmm. um, pushing from one house to another. And um, in order to enable us to get from one house to another um, without going out into the street because the street was heavily fired on by enemy soldiers, but we went through the walls. So they gave us um, concussion grenades for the bazooka, uh, you know, the rocket launcher, mm -hmm. instead of it being anti-tank, it was, uh, it was uh, concussion that broke through the walls, made a big hole, and we could go from one wow. building to another. Now, um, in one of the buildings from which uh, uh, my little unit and I took five prisoners, um, uh, we sent them back, and uh, and in that apartment, I uh, gathered up the bazooka, you know, the rocket launcher, and a, a few rockets, uh, because I had seen tanks up the street. Mm -hmm. And um, sure enough, they sent tanks down, toward, down the street, right toward my building. And I waited until the German tank was right opposite the, f uh, the, the window of this house. And I let go uh, with one of the rockets. And there was a tremendous explosion. The concussion from which rocked me back on my feet. You know, he was out on the street. I was in the house. But I felt the concussion. I figured that's the end of that ta uh, tank. And then I hear the engine start up again. I was very shocked, but he didn't come forward anymore. He started to go backward. And I remembered that uh, one way to disable a tank was to aim for his tread. You know, mm -hmm. his. So the next shot I aimed for the tread and sure enough, it blew it off the, mm -hmm. the gear, and he couldn't go back anymore. He he was skidding on one track, so he went back in an arc like this. And he was parked with a gun still facing my building. It was about a uh, hundred yards away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now. I didn't find out, until, well, I, I should mention that uh, um, I was in the cellar of this building. There was a tank a hundred yards away, 
and behind the tank was some German infantry. And I'm looking through this cellar window, uh, which had two iron bars um, uh, uh, in the window and in the uh, hollow, and uh, um, it was just a hollowed out space mm -hmm. uh, through the wall of the basement. And I'm looking uh, alongside these bars and I saw uh, an enemy infantry soldier. So I put my rifle up leaning against the bar and I remember that um, I couldn't draw a clear picture of that enemy soldier, so I, I canted the rifle, which was a no-no. I knew that we weren't supposed to cant it, but I couldn't get a clear shot. So I tilted the rifle, and when I let go, I fired the, the enemy soldier, just kept on walking, and I was surprised because I, I was a sharpshooter. And uh, then I looked at the iron bar, and there was a furrow plowed in it. Wow. I had cleared when I canted the rifle. I, I left the muzzle against the... Uh -huh. That's why I didn't get a clear picture. <coughs> so I missed. And just then, that disabled tank, a hundred yards away, saw the blast of my rifle, and he fired a shot. Uh, it didn't hit my window. It hit about few yards to my left, and it blew uh, a hole into that cellar wall, and the debris from the cellar wall came into my face, mainly from the left side. I still have a few particles, and then one under my left eye and one on my chin. And uh, I realized that uh, I was wounded. I, I, I was very, my first impression was intense surprise. How could this happen to me? And I realized that unconsciously, I figured I was immune. I, I, mm -hmm. That was my psychological armor. But um, after this intense surprise, I realized I was uh, hit, and I couldn't see anything. The last I saw was a, was like a ball of fire from that explosion, and then I couldn't see. And I said, "Well, you're blind, but Lillian will love you anyhow." Mm -hmm. And uh, I was comforted. <laughs> So uh, after that, I was slowly evacuated. The, the, uh, the company medic came up to me, and I had um, shrapnel wounds in the, in the face and in the right shoulder. Mm -hmm. There's a piece uh, missing from the right shoulder, yeah. as you can see. Okay. Um, they, they bandaged me up and slowly we moved back. Mm -hmm. They gave you morphine. Yeah, they you gave me morphine mm -hmm. for the pain. And uh, eventually I reached a point where they um, put me on a plane and flew me back across the channel to a hospital in Bath, B-A-T-H, mm -hmm. England. I was in that hospital for couple of months, I guess, and then later on they shipped me to another hospital mm -hmm. and Still. then back home mm -hmm. um, because I didn't have use of that right shoulder. It was, uh, um, they cleared up the blindness. They, it was mainly particles, uh, maybe hundreds of little particles embedded in the eye. 
and they over a period of months they kept clearing the eyes mm -hmm. um, and uh, their left eye they still they left a little piece you could see a, a bloodshot there mm -hmm. in the left eye you yeah, see I see that well, yeah. the left eye is blind Huh? Your left eye is blind. Yeah, my left eye is uh, blind. Uh, I see only out of the right eye. Okay. Uh, now, let me, let me just ask you, when you were in Germany, were you aware of the concentration camps at all? No, uh, I wasn't. In fact, uh, there's an incident um, in Saw Mountain. I broke into one of the houses, and there was an aged couple with the, uh, the man who was stretched out on a couch in the living room, and the woman was crying, and she kept saying, Nish Nazi, Nish Nazi, they all said Nish Nazi. Mm -hmm. But when I went up into the attic, I searched the building, there were Nazi banners, and um, it was uh, quite typical that they, you know, they mm -hmm. tried to hide their past. And um, um, when I was in the hospital, and I mentioned this, uh, this uh, failure to destroy the tank, although I did disable it, uh, one of the men said to me, tell me, um, the bazooka cartridge that you used, did it have a, a round nose or a pointed nose? I said it was a round nose. He said that was not armor piercing. Armor piercing is pointed round noses to explode holes in buildings to oh. get from one building. I was using the wrong ammunition for the tank. I, I had never heard in training mm -hmm. that there was uh, two kinds of ammunition for the bazooka. I only thought of it as an anti-tank weapon. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I think all the men with me uh, only thought of it as an anti-tank. We didn't know there was, they, but to expedite our movement through the city, they issued these round nose cartridges, which mm -hmm. I didn't know about. So that, that's how come I didn't destroy that tank. But they, um, they, get, they well, gave me... Well, you have to get me, back uh, to the story of the couple and oh, what happened. Oh, yes. In answer to, uh, an answer question. to your question. In one of the buildings that I stormed into, there was an aged couple. <laughs> and the woman was crying and she said her husband isn't well. And er darf spritz, which means he needs an injection. I gathered that he was uh, diabetic. Mm -hmm. I said, look, lady, I have nothing to do with that. Uh, we're infantry. When Later on, when the rear echelon come up, they'll help you. She said, no, no, er darf spritz. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, there's a hospital down the street. Well, I hadn't heard about the hospital, and I was interested in that. I said, well, it's too dangerous to go through the street at night, at, by the day, but I'll come at night with another man and a litter, and we'll, we'll get him back to the hospital, which we did. Um, but when we got to this little hospital, it was in a cellar. Uh, I I could see that it was staffed by nuns, mm -hmm. and the chief nun there uh, got to talk with me a little, and she said, uh, "How come you speak German?" I said, "Well, I studied it at school and also at home." I heard Yiddish, and Yiddish is very similar to, to German. When I said, I heard Yiddish at home, this nurse's head went down suddenly as though I had hit her on the head, and she couldn't look at me anymore. 
And I said to myself, something is going on there in Germany with the Jews that you don't know about. Mm -hmm. And that was my first inkling that there was such a thing as uh, death camps, mm -hmm. concentration camps. Later on, after I was in hospital in England, I got letters from buddies uh, after they had liberated one of the camps in the world, W-E-R-L-E, I think it is. And it was a, a small camp in my division liberated. And they told me of these walking skeletons that they encountered um, in the camp. And that, that's when it, I really got a, mm -hmm. an ear full of it. Okay. So you ended up uh, in a hospital in England, and, and then you were shipped back to the States? Yes, sir. Uh, they shipped me uh, to a hospital in... Uh, when you landed first, you went to Halloran Hospital in Staten Island. Yeah, but I was only there for a day or two. And, and they you went moved to, me uh, to West Virginia. Martinsburg, West Virginia. Martinsburg, West Virginia. There was an army hospital. Now, how close was that to the end of the war? Wow. Tell about your trip home on the ship, on the Elizabeth. I uh, came home on the Elizabeth, came which was a back to the States on ship. the Elizabeth, and it was the in April mm -hmm. of um, '45. And through the hospital, through the ship broadcasting company, they announced that President Roosevelt had died, mm -hmm. and there would be a memorial service in the ship's chapel the next morning which I attended, and it had April 45. people from all over the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Lord knows it. We were all together in the chapel uh, for the service and memorial to FDR. So um, uh, it was uh, shortly after that that I, I reached um, the hospital in uh, um, Martinsburg, Martinsburg, West Virginia. Martinsburg, West Virginia. Where well, you were sort of in and out over a period of months for rehabilitation treatment. They had rehabilitation treatment to get mm -hmm. me to use this arm um, more effectively. And um, they also kept treating the eyes, removing little pieces of rubble from both eyes, mainly the left, but the, the left, uh, they, they couldn't restore the sight in the left eye. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, were, you were in and out of the hospital for a period for you from April when you came back to what they called ZI, which is the Zone of Interior. They said you're going to be ZI, which meant you were going to be sent to Zone of Interior, which was the continental United States. Mm -hmm. And once you were in the ZI, uh, you were in and out of the hospital in West Virginia over a period of months, from April to the time you were discharged, which was October. Mm -hmm. October 1945? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, I. I ended up by army uh, enlistment uh, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, did you get a pension because of? Yes. Your... Yes, there Everyone who was discharged from the hospital was interviewed by someone from the Veterans Authority who went over its disabilities and, uh, and uh, assigned a disability rating. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> When I first came through, they rated me 100% disabled, mm -hmm. probably because of partial blindness or that, whatever. But then, in a few months, uh, when I was uh, a civilian, they called me to the VA in New York, 
and uh, they reduced it from 100 percent to, I think, 50 percent. Well, but there's another feature about um, the support of the government. He, at that time, when he came back, he, he had trained to be a high school English teacher. Mm -hmm. There were no jobs in, in the New York City system. So he decided to shift gears completely and decided to go to social work school. Mm -hmm. His career was as a social worker. We went to the Columbia School of Social Work for, for his master's. All during that period, he got a pension not just related to uh, his war experience, but it was a kind of uh, basic support for, it, it was called, not the GI Bill, but mm -hmm. for one who had been wounded, it was called Public Law 16, mm -hmm. which was for those who had been disabled and needed rehabilitation and turning the corner for civilian life. Mm -hmm. So he got his Master's of Social Work from Columbia University with, it wasn't lavish, but we were able to manage uh, our economy. In fact, we had the first of our four children during that period. Mm -hmm. It says on our daughter's birth certificate, occupation of father student. Mm -hmm. And that helped us really to turn that corner where you went into the career of social work, oh, yes. which became yeah. his, his career. Mm -hmm. Yes, the period. government paid my tuition on a living expense mm -hmm. exactly until I right. graduated mm -hmm. from social work school and was able to obtain employment. Mm -hmm. Now, after, after you got out, did you join any veterans organizations? Mm -hmm. Remember the ABC, the American Veterans Committee? Oh, yeah, it was a, there was an it American was in formation at that time. So I, it was sort of ideological. I thought of the American Legion as just money grabbers uh, to get pensions from the government. And I didn't see that as a function of a veterans organization. I thought a veterans organization should be geared to public service and helping in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that was the program at that time of a new uh, veterans group called ABC, the American Veterans Committee, where the program was what can we contribute mm -hmm. as volunteers and workers uh, to the good of the country rather than just grabbing benefits. So that appealed to me. Uh, ABC. Uh, it didn't out. last too long. It was mm -hmm. repeated out for lack of, of veteran support and mm -hmm. government support, I guess, too. I don't know. Did you end up joining the VFW? or? Uh, I, I ended up joining the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you? Yeah. Well, I think know. I'm still a member of the right. VFW. I know. You're a member of the Jewish War Veterans. No, it was another one. What's that? That would be cool. Okay. I think the Jewish war veterans I'm quitting, I, they, they're no use to me, but uh, I still am a member of the... Uh, you, there was a disabled war veterans, you just, the DAV, the Disabled American Veterans, which oh. you, I think, belong to for a while, but I'm, I'm okay. not I belong complete. to a couple of organizations, but uh, mm -hmm. currently I... I I think I'm still a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Okay. Now you mentioned going to reunions and now... That's the 95th Division Association. Mm -hmm. And you uh, stayed in contact with the people you were in the service with? Yes. Uh, well, until recently, I, uh, I, there was one contact. He had been one of our lieutenants, uh, Max. Um, Lewis. Lewis, who was a real hero. He kept up with his men. He kept an eye on his men. He didn't send men anywhere where he didn't keep up with them. Mm -hmm. He's an unusual officer. Max Lewis's home was in Alaska. Juno. Mm -hmm. In Juno, and we became good friends and continued a correspondence. In fact, he visited, he visited us several times here. Oh. 
He was he visited us a few times here. And uh, he's now passed on. But he since died. I was also in touch with um uh, a G Company. Uh, William Everly from Albany. Huh? You will met William Eberly. William Eberly, his home was in Albany. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I organized a reunion of G Company in Albany. Oh. Uh, because that's where Eberly lived, who was a platoon leader. But shortly before the reunion date, he died, oh. Evelyn died. But we did have the reunion, and I have some correspondence from, uh, I don't think I brought it here, of um, fellow uh, G Company veterans that corresponded, and we got together in Albany mm -hmm. uh, for a reunion that was about 20 years ago, I guess. I'm not sure our grandson came with us at that time, and he was already a young adult, so years had passed where you had a continuing. Then you have a lieutenant who still lives in Missoula, Montana, yes, and that you uh, uh, correspond with. I'm still in touch with uh, one of our officers uh, whose home is in Missoula, Montana. Mm -hmm. his, his name is, uh, um, no, thank God. When you're 90 years old, your memory gets mm -hmm. terrible. <laughs> now, did you bring any pictures at all, or just the... I, I did. Uh, this is, um... Uh, no, we didn't bring a picture okay. of you in uniform. All right, if you just want to hold that up, I can zoom in on the cover and at least mm -hmm. get a picture of your uh, unit insignia. And that's the 95th yes. Infantry Division. Yeah, the 9 and the B. Okay. All right, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, these are newspaper clippings about the 95th Division, so mainly returning home. Okay. Um, Okay, and, and how many children and grandchildren do you have? We had four children. Tragically, we lost a son mm -hmm. who died of brain cancer at age 50. We have a daughter and two surviving sons, and uh, our Four grandchildren are all children of our daughter, mm -hmm. and they all live in Jerusalem. Oh, really? And from them we have seven great-grandchildren. Oh, that's wonderful. And they visit us. We uh, recently had a visit from our middle grandson and his wife and little son. Mm -hmm. And we're in very close touch. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview, sir. Well, you're very welcome.